next up we have Liam Gridwood and he'll be talking about the challenges for the ecosystem and companies when it comes to open sourcing uh, historically closed source uh, firmware for sound soundboards. <laughs> so give it up for Liam Gridwood. Thank you for coming today. Um, as was said there, this is, um, a, has been a journey for us um, to take closed source firmware and how to open source it. Um, so this is not um, firmware when I'm um, boot firmware, this is audio DSP firmware. So I'm relatively a, a firmware newbie. Uh, I usually attend um, Linux conferences. So if, for me, uh, I've been introduced to all the different aspects of, of boot firmware today, so um, I'm going to try and talk about audio firmware now. And the mission of this is just to, to help other people who are considering open sourcing firmware. Um, and that, that could be firmware for another audio DSP, or it could be firmware they have for their sensors, or, or any particular subsystem within, within their hardware. And I'm, I'm trying to inspire others and describe the challenges that we had and how we've overcome those challenges or, or trying to overcome these challenges to make, make a successful open source project. Lastly, I'll also be introducing the architecture of, of the firmware as well. There, there may be some similarities to other firmwares or to, um, you'll, you'll notice if, if anyone's familiar with Linux, there's, there's been some similar, similarities there. Um, about me, I work for Intel. Um, I'm a software architect there. I've been using Linux pretty long, since 94. I am the developer of the, the sound system, subsystem for SOX within Linux, and also for the power management IC subsystem in Linux. I'm relatively new to firmware. Um, I've only been working on firmware since um, 2015 with audio firmware, but before that I'm pretty much um, an, an audio guy and, and a kernel guy. So what is sound open firmware? Um, it's really a, an infrastructure for developing audio processing um, algorithms and on, on a non, um, on an agnostic hardware platform. So because Intel is the main sponsor here, it doesn't necessarily force software on, on Intel hardware. The, the, one of the key decisions was to make this as generic as possible so that you could run this on ARM as well or you could run it on a TI DSP. There's nothing specifically within the driver or within the firmware that, that ties it to, to Intel. So the, the dark ages. So when I say the dark ages here, this is reference to uh, not in the medieval period, but to the, the, the darkness within the audio landscape prior to having open source firmware. Um, so I've been working on audio drivers a long time, and I've you know, been working with drivers that have had to talk to a DSP for a long time. And the, the biggest problem we all, always had was that this firmware team was usually located in another country, in another time zone, and it, they would go and write the firmware, and this firmware would be traditionally written for Windows. And they would give you this firmware release later on, and when you had to write the Linux driver for this, you had many, many questions. You had problems getting it to work. You had problems getting it to boot. You had problems getting high-quality audio playback. You had problems hitting the PKIs for, for power. Um, and this usually involved us lots of email discussions to this other time zone and they would reply back. And to fix a simple bug, it would usually take you about three or four days. And they, they would never share their source code with us. You know, they kept it in-house. We would ask, they would often provide us with documentation. And this documentation obviously would, would never be as up to date uh, as the source code. So this, this is just not with Intel, this is with my, my employment history before, and when I was consulting as well, you, you tend, tend to always get a closed source audio DSP firmware. So ha changing course, let's look at wh wh why we, we want to, to, to change course here. So for audio, the, you know, the, there is market drivers here, and we're getting a lot of customers asking for us to open source the firmware. We have customers who want to 
be able to use the audio DSP for general purpose compute as well. We have customers who want to customize their audio processing, processing algorithms alongside with the use cases. So, so when Intel does a, a firmware for, for audio, it tends to have a, a set of requirements in mind. Uh, and those requirements may well suit very well to a laptop or a PC, but they might not be that good for a car or for a mobile phone. So uh, having this open allows for the customization by, by the customer here. There's also a lot of growth in areas. I mean, the, an example at the bottom here is on the, the home assistance. So there's an awful lot of growth there. So, so having this open as an infrastructure provides um, help for the companies making those devices. What another driver was, well, the initial driver for, for SOF certainly was the, the menu board, and there's a menu board sitting outside actually. So the goal behind the menu board project was to provide a completely open source hardware, software, and firmware platform. And the, they had done very, very well. They had open sourced everything except for the audio DSP firmware. And so when they came to me and asked, because they came to me as I was the driver author, they came to me and said, Liam, how can we open source firmware for this? So my, my first look was to ask the existing firmware teams. Uh, and those guys were um, traditionally from a, a closed source environment. And you know, there was a lot of pushback. You know, this cannot be open source for, for various reasons. So I took it on myself as a, a one-man project to see how, how difficult it, it would be to, to, to develop a firmware for, for the menu board here. Uh, and you can see the, the characteristics of the DSP. It has a, a, a very, very small memory. Uh, it's, you know, it doesn't have two gigabytes of RAM like the Batrial CPU there. We're talking kilobytes of RAM. Um, so so there, there were challenges there. So this is the, the, the architecture of this DSP we were um, targeting here. You can basically see it's uh, a single core, DSP core, and it has a couple of DMA engines. And the SSP ports on the right-hand side, those are your audio interfaces. So those would be for sending I2S audio out. Um, there is uh, instruction cache, instruction RAM, and in total, we're looking at 96K of RAM. So when you think about writing a, a, a an application, when you say that to an application developer, you know, 96K is too small for them. Uh, and even for Linux, you know, you're never going to get Linux running on 96K of instruction RAM there. So it meant, you know, starting a firmware from scratch here. Um, and also to fit into this 168K data RAM. And so you have to fit your audio buffers in there as well. So, so th th that was quite a challenge there. But I'll come to that later, how we came to overcome that. Um, the host, so this is the, what the DSP looks like, but there's a, this mailbox here, this is what the, the host driver communicates with the DSP. So the host driver basically sends IPC commands to and from this. So as well as providing a, a DSP firmware, we had to provide a host driver as well. I'm going to talk about the challenges here. So it, it wasn't just a case of writing firmware. Uh, and testing and validating it, there was a lot more complexities involved. Um, number one, and Intel being a large organization, and I, I've worked at other large organizations before Intel, the, the number one challenge is political challenges. Um, we found that, you know, when you speak to colleagues, most were the, either strongly in favor of open sourcing audio DSP firmware, and, or, or most were, sorry, the, the, the most proportion of people were either strongly in favor or strongly against. There wasn't many people who, who were neutral. Um, the people who were most strongly against were the, the current closed source firmware team. Um, they saw this as a threat to their jobs. Uh, they asking about fears of disclosing IP, how we add value. Um, but you generally have to be prepared for this, and you have to be able to speak to them and tell them there, there's no job fear here, uh, and you ex tell them the benefits of open source. So, so now that you know we have went down this path, these are the same people who are developing the open source firmware. Uh, and they're all actively, I would say, enjoying this because um, they, you've, you've, I've taken them from a closed source world and you know, they're really getting involved now um, with, with firmware uh, on GitHub. Um, the, the one thing I will say is that the quote from Margaret Thatcher at the bottom there, um, 
uh, it's true because you will have to be prepared to fight the same battle more than once to win it. And I, I'm still having discussions with colleagues about the benefits of open source firmware against closed source firmware. What, what did help me is, you know, certainly have some code that you can share, you can demo, um, go to other conferences and talk about it. So I talked about SOF back at Plumbers Conference uh, for Linux in 2017. Uh, you know, uh, for, 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 for me, you know, get, getting customers on side so you could talk about it, and then customers would eventually ask for it. Um, the sales guys and the marketing guys were very keen as well because they saw that as a way to enable customers. Um, so it's all about, you know, get, gather momentum within your own organization to do this. If I go into the technical challenges, um, usually when you're doing an application, open sourcing an application, the, the compiler is not a technical challenge because you have these compilers for x86, for ARM, they're open source already. But our DSP runs on the Tensilica ISA. And the, the problem here is that the, the GCC compiler ca can generate um, Tensilica code, but it cannot do any of the, the SIMD instructions. So when I say SIMD instructions, it's a single instruction, multiple data. So on, on Intel architecture, those would be things like SSE or uh, AVX. So the Cadence compiler can do that, but the GCC compiler can't. Um, Unfortunately, the, the, you know, for an open source project, you do need to have a, an open source compiler because you, you, know, you, want, you don't want to restrict anyone taking part. You want you know, guys, hackers in their bedrooms to be able to write code. So, we, you know, Cadence were very good. They said to us, okay, we, we realize this is a, an open source project. We realize that you want to enable everybody. So they were very good and they provided a free compiler for MinoBoard. So you can go to the Cadence website and you can download this compiler and it will generate all the, the SIMD instructions for the minimum board target. We, we are actively working on getting this support into to GCC as well. So after we've got a compiler, we need to build an image because a compiler will generate an ELF file. Um, and unfortunately, you cannot send this ELF file to the DSP and for the DSP to execute that ELF file. You've actually got to you know, format this L file into an image of the, the memory ar um, architecture of the, the DSP so that you know, the DSP can boot it. Um, so, so we had to do that. So before we could run any code, we had to build this um, image builder as well. This is open source now as well. This is a tool called R image. You'll notice at the bottom there, we have an unsigned image. I'll come to that a bit later. But at this point, we should be able to run code. We, we hope. But when I tried to run code, it didn't work. Now, I had lots of documentation because I work for Intel, so I could read the documentation about Baytrail. I could read the documentation about the, the DSP. But the documentation didn't contain the, the, the validated programming flows for certain parts of the boot and for the, the SSP ports, amongst other things. There was also no way I could connect the debugger or, 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 or printf from this. So what I did was, um, Chemu had basic extensive support. So I had to extend Chemu to add support for our DSP into Chemu. And then I could take the, the closed source DSP firmware and run it on my Chemu model. And from that, I could determine the sequence it was using to boot. So I could validate my sequence against that. So I knew once I had Chemu running, or, sorry, the closed source running on Chemu, I could then translate that into the open source firmware, and then I could have open source running on Chemu. After open source was running on Chemu, I could take it to the hardware, the real hardware, and I could boot. So that, that was a big step forward. So you may have to do this, and this depends on whether, I mean, for, for Intel being such a big company, the people who did the closed source firmware, lots of them had left. Lots of them had reorganized to different organizations. So, and lots of them were working on other projects. So I, I did ask around a lot for help, but I found that people had left and people who were too busy to help me. So this, is, this was the, the quickest route, the, the path of least resistance. The next challenge I had was that after I could boot, I found that, oh, wait a minute, I, I cannot play any audio here. So I also had to then virtualize the host site because I wanted to run the, the driver that was used with the closed source firmware on the closed source firmware within a Chemu environment. So I could send commands to the firmware 
and order it for to, uh, to program the DMAs and to program the SSP ports in the correct sequence. Because I, I had the documentation, but the documentation didn't tell me the, the, the exact sequence I needed to program. So uh, I did this, and what you can see here is a heterogeneous um, emulator. On the left-hand side is an, an x86 VM, so you can run um, Ubuntu there or, or Chrome or even Windows on, on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is your DSP emulator, and you can run your firmware binary on that right-hand side. You can actually attach GDB to them both, um, which is very useful because then you can step through. Uh, I've got two GDBs there. Um, I was at the GNU Tools Cauldron on Saturday and Sunday, and I found out there's new technology, which means you can have one instance of GDB now connecting to two different architectures with two different images. So this will be in the, the next G GDB release. So with this, I was able to fully validate my sequences. And you know, once I had seen the sequences used by the closed source firmware, I could then uh, play audio. But that was all good on Miniboard. Then the next generation of platforms came along, and they introduced code signing. So even though I'd went through all that pain and effort to be able to play audio on Miniboard, the next generation for well, this is with Apollo Lake. This is on the upsquared board, and there's an upsquared board outside for you to look at. Um, I could not run any code on upsquared because of code signing. So the only people that had the key to sign were the, the closed source firmware team, who by this time wouldn't speak to me, and the, the OEM. But luckily, the OEM would speak to me. So the OEM thought it was a very good idea. The company who make Upsquared, they, they want to you know, build a developer community around their hardware. So they took our um, public private signing key, and they installed it on their BIOS image. So you can take, you can sign, you sign with our signing key, and you can run your firmware on Upsquared. Um, the signing tool we have is open source as well. So I know Travis was talking earlier on about um, Intel um, signing systems. Well, I, I, you know, this is one that's already open source, um, and it's using public key cryptography 1.5 and OpenSSL to do the signing. Um, there was an implication here as well because we were using GCC, GCC three, uh, sorry, GCC I think above 5.2 has a, a, the GPL three clause. And for those that don't know, there was a thing called the Tivoization clause, and this basically meant that GCC could not be used to build software that run on signed systems without there being a means of signing the code an open source means of signing it. So, you know, this is, we, we are fully compliant here because we have this system where you can sign code, but we've also given you the tools and the key to be able to sign it. The last challenge is, is probably something that, you know, everyone's aware of here is, you know, to build a community behind your, your firmware. And, you know, we've seen many others, you know, they have GitHub repos, they have websites, mailing lists, IRCs, wikis, and everything. We, we've done that as well, and you know we've we've moved to GitHub, and we've found with GitHub it's been very very helpful for us. Well, I, I found that our team who were are now you know the the closed source team who traditionally worked on Windows, they were very very hesitant about coming to work on a mailing list. They they did not really want to be involved in a project where they sent patches on a mailing list, but when we said okay if if we move to GitHub would you work with us? And they took a look at GitHub and thought, okay, yes, we can work with that because it has a graphical interface, and all our developers are used to that. Uh, you know, so if if you need to do that, I, I would recommend that because that then brings people within your organisation who are maybe not used to open source, uh, brings them alongside to help you. I've also had to educate them a bit as well, so that you know the team from the Windows side that they're. they're they, they, they're, you know, they're very new to open source, so you have to go through the basics, things about you know, releasing early and often, don't do abandoned wear, you know, do, don't do infrequent code drops. They, they were very nervous about accepting patches from other people um, because it wouldn't be validated, and you then had to explain uh, how to build a CI system to cope with that. But, but one, I found once everything was explained to them, you know, they were very much on board. Uh, so now we get to the stage where we're actually running code. Um, 
Just showing the architecture here, so that the driver, again, its driver is not tied to x86. It, there's nothing x86 specific in the driver. The driver can have multiple backends for sending the control data. So th this plane here, this control data plane here can be MMIO, it can be SPI, it can be USB. It doesn't have to be a PCI device. Um, so, you know, the driver can run on, on any architecture. We've even got a, an RTOS in the bottom there, and our, our driver is BSD licensed on GPL. So it could be copy and pasted if needed. The, on, on the firmware side, on the right-hand side as well, we took a decision as well to have some freedom with the underlying RTOS. So at the moment, we have this thing called XTOS. Now, XTOS is released by Cadence, so that's the, the default RTOS you get with the extensive architecture. But it, some people don't want to use that. They want to use Zephyr or they want to use free RTOS. So we're adding support for something called CMSYST, which allows us to abstract that RTOS layer very, very cheaply. So that customers can then decide which one they want. Um, it looks like a traditional firmware stack at the bottom as well. You have the, the platform drivers. At the top is our audio processing components. Now, some people ask us, how, to, how do you add value into open source firmware? Um, the boxes here, these two here, are um, value add. So because the, we've got a permissive license on the firmware, it allows companies to come along and say, well, I've got this great active noise cancellation algorithm, or I've got this great speaker protection algorithm. I want to sell. So I don't want to open source it. I say that that's fine. You can then um, integrate your algorithm, or you can you know, ship it as a binary, or you can externally integrate it, and customers can then pay royalties for that. But, but you're not stopping any value add from, from, you know, from stakeholders who want to, you know, who live on the, the, the money they make from, from value add there. Drivers, again, it's a, a, a very standard driver architecture. At the top there is our um, integration with, with Alsa, with Linux. And way down at the bottom is, is our um, low-level parts of the driver deal with talking to the DSP. And this part in the middle, again, it doesn't have to be um, MMIO. It can be USB or SPI or I2C. It's, there's, this, the transport here is, you know, the driver is pretty generic there. Just some history, so, so 2015 is when I started working on the project by myself uh, as a Skunk Works project. So I knew, my manager knew, and his manager knew, and uh, pretty much nobody else. Um, then, you know, things gathered speed. We, we had working on code on Bay Trail then, we had ChemU support, and we got Cherry Trail and Braswell supported. And then at this time, the, the closed source guys heard about us and they tried to kill us and everything. They tried very hard to do that. Um, after about 2017, this is when we announced to, to the world via the Plumbers Conference, and by, by that time we had all the, the firmware running on the non-code signing platforms, so you know, everything up to Apollo Lake. After we got our code signing done, then you know, at the bottom here for 2018, this is when the closed source team joined us. So we went from a team of one up to about you know, 20, 30 people now, all contributing to the firmware. So we can see now we're starting to have code for next generation devices as well as the, the legacy devices now. So, you know, we are, we're no longer a skunk's work, we're an official project. And we have asks from customers as well, so which is very good. The development kit looks like this. So, uh, you know, because we're releasing a firmware, you're not just releasing a firmware source code, you have to release an SDK. Um, because the, the tools are quite customized and specialized. So remember, I, I talked about the, 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 the compiler options here. So we have either the GCC or the Keynes compiler. Um, we have the image tool and we have the signing tool. These are all open source. The, the one that isn't open source is the Keynes compiler. We have topology compiler as well, which is open source. So these parts are open source. So when I say topology, you typically in audio have a pipeline of processing from the, the source to the sync, and the topology is used to define that. So the, the team from the closed source world, they had a GUI which allowed you to do that, and it saved it as XML file, so we still support that. But we needed an open source alternative to allow the community to create pipelines as well, uh, and this was all done in AM4. 
Right, once you've signed the image, it then goes to the driver. We've got debug facilities as well, so we've got uh, tracing and debug FS. So it allows you to inspect the, the whole DSP memory, the DSP trace events. We've got our emulation on this side as well, you know, our Chemulon. Cadence also do an emulator, um, but this emulator again is something you have to pay for. The interesting thing, Google contributed this, this Docker support. So we have this option to put most of the SDK within a Docker container. And that's very, very useful because it allows you to deploy this container because the firmware has um, certain dependencies and libraries and tools. And those are some, you know, it's quite hard to deploy on your average Ubuntu system because a lot of the dependencies are, are bleeding edge. For example, the, the topology compiler depends on bleeding edge ALSA lib and bleeding edge ALSA utils, which are not yet released into a package which Ubuntu or Red Hat can pull. So you generally, you don't want to update your, your desktop with a bleeding edge one because it might be buggy. So you can do this all in this container. Uh, the container is very handy for CI as well because you can run uh, um, this as part of your CI. You can run the builds and everything. Again, um, we, we've, this is the, the, the pillars of, of building a, a successful project. And we've tried to be, have permissive license in everything we can. So in places where we haven't got permissive licenses, for example, the, the, our kernel is dual licensed. So for, for everything else, we've tried to be a BSD or MIT. We've tried to make everything modular so customers can take out parts they don't need. They would be modular in that respect so that you find that some customers have their own special algorithm and it can take up more memory and they want to ditch some other algorithms or some other code. That, that's all doable. Portable, we're not tied to any particular DSP architecture. We're not tied to any particular you know, Intel product. Uh, and tool rich as well, we pr try to provide as many tools as we possibly can because going through the bring up myself, I found that a lack of tools was a, a problem and I needed to you know, write a um, trace tool, I needed to write an image tool, I needed to write a signing tool, uh, and emulation, emulation tools as well. So it was because those tools were useful for me, you know, I th thought they'd be useful to other people as well. And uh, thanks, and please uh, drop by the booth. <laughs>